I mean, what are 44 days? Well, Charles, let's start with you. Well, where do we begin? But more to the point, where do we end? <laughs> That's the extraordinary thing. But yes, take it away. Well, where did it go wrong for her, do you think? I think it went wrong. For, she forgot two basic rules. One is politics is about the art of the possible, a phrase made famous by uh, somebody called Rab Butler, mm -hmm. who was Chancellor of the Exchequer when the Queen became Queen back in 1952. And, of course, the Queen, the, our longest reigning monarch, her last duty was to <laughs> appoint our shortest-serving Prime Minister. Yeah. So she didn't realise that politics is the art of the possible, and she forgot something that Mrs Thatcher thought about. Mrs Thatcher had lots of ideas, and they were presented, many of them, to her in a plan called Stepping Stones. And the Stepping Stones idea was, if you want to get to there, these are the steps you need to take to get to there. And Liz Truss actually stood on a platform of, I'm going to go for growth, lower taxes and more growth. But she didn't set out stepping stones. She tried to do it literally overnight, mm -hmm. in 48 hours, without consulting anybody except her Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the markets reacted badly, the tempest got worse, and she was seen to be a vulnerable person who it all came to a sudden like end. she didn't learn the lessons from, from Prime Ministers previous, right? I mean, yeah. what's your take? No, and, and I think the really striking thing, actually, is if when she'd done that mini-budget, she'd just gone out and announced the energy package, which was what everyone was expecting to happen, she would still be Prime Minister. She's really the architect of her own downfall. It was going out and promising those tens of billions of un unfunded tax cuts that pretty much everyone said, you can't do that, the markets are going to react in the way they did. And, and the, the real mistake is the hubris. She thought she and Kwasi Kwarteng knew better and that it was all going to be OK, and mm. of course it wasn't. And the really sorry thing now for all of us is that we can't get back to where we were before that mini-budget. That market crash, that pound plunge, yeah. that has added so much onto people's mortgages, for example, onto the cost of living, the cost of food, food prices have gone up, and we can't get back there. And we're all suffering, ordinary people are suffering as a result of Liz Truss's terrible decision. So, yes, she's resigned, but we're all the worse off for those 44 days. I wonder what Nick thinks. Nick. Nick. I mean, you interview politicians every day, you speak to real people every day. You know, what's, your, what's the view from the coalface? Uh, the view from the coalface, my, my call was this morning, a fizzing with one thing. And if, as I'm sure Giles would concede, if the Conservatives need some kind of unity now, I have to tell you that Boris Johnson, whose name is already, of course, being mooted, is anything but. I cannot tell you how absolutely split my callers are. They are either for Boris, yes, look at the victory that he brought about for the Conservatives, or they are against Boris. Don't forget how he behaved. He had these parties. He behaved in an appalling way. He was drinking the Prosecco. So he's a really divisive figure. If the Conservatives want unity, they need to be aware of that. But here's an interesting idea. And, and just think on this. Where did Liz Truss go wrong? Well, initially, she got everything right. A Conservative Prime Minister talking about tax cuts, stimulating growth, cutting corporation tracks, trying to bring on business, cutting up energy bills. for What's not to like? Her problem was to underscore what Giles said, there was no pathway, that the ground was not prepared. It suddenly came out of nowhere. She had a tin ear to the state of the economy, both in the UK and globally, and that's where it went wrong. And I have to also say today, uh, Dermot, from my callers, um, there is very little sympathy for her either. And what about your listeners, Nick? Are they calling for, like, general election now? What are they saying? A lot are. Mm -hmm. a, a lot are. I mean, I think they're asking us to take the fifth Conservative Prime Minister in six years and something like the third in about three months. There is a lot of talk for that. Now, if you are on the Conservative side of the fence, Alison, you know that that is effectively turkeys and Christmas. It is game over. Yeah. There are massive, massive leads for the Labour Party in the polls. So the Conservative listeners are saying no... A lot of support for Rishi Sunak, I have to say. He has been seen to be right. He pretty much called it day by day or drop by drop in our pound and our economy if Liz Truss got through and implemented her policies. So if, if, if you've had enough of the Tories, yes, you want a general election. You're with Sir Keir Starmer. You're with Sir Ed Davey. If you are more of a blue, then you want to give them, what, two and a bit years to see if they can turn it around and, indeed, whether a bit of global markets come back as well. It's interesting, Nick, isn't it? It's quite hard not to strip this down to party political lines. But I think a lot of people do, that poll do want to see a general election mm. because they're mm. sick of this. And in one respect, we mm. have this parliamentary system. So you, you vote for the party, you vote for your MP, your party represents you mm. in Parliament. But a lot of people see that the presidential style that these yeah. guys have taken on uh, in, in the hustings and leadership elections has been anything but a mm. parliamentary system. And then the, 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 the manifesto is kind of 
to all intents and purposes, been ripped up. So you could argue maybe that's not what people voted for in the mm. first place. And so it's kind of like, do we go with precedent or do we go with yeah. what's kind of what we feel morally obliged here? I think to me. that's the key word, isn't it, morally? So there's no constitutional obligation for the Conservative Party to say, right, now we're going to have a general election. But I think given how much has changed, yeah. we've had the pandemic, we've had this massive spike in energy bills, we've had a Prime Minister Liz Truss come in. I disagree with Nate. I don't think it is what the country wanted, these tax cuts. There's no democratic mandate for them whatsoever. And now we're in an entirely different place, thanks to Liz Truss. I think we do need a general election. And actually, if you look at the polls, there's a really, really big majority. It's over 60% of the public say they want a general election. And I think it's just over 20% say, no, let's just stick with it for now. So I think there's going to be a lot of public pressure, no matter who the Conservatives choose, saying, you know, we haven't had a say now for quite a while as a country while all this stuff has been changing. It needs to come to us as voters, not Tory MPs, not Conservative Party members. But the, the strange thing that, I, that struck me last night when I was watching it is they've, they've now changed the... kind of changed the rules on how they, mm -hmm. how they elect the leader of the Tory party, which then... the impact of which, of which is they've changed the rules on how we get our... our Prime Minister. So it's fine for the rules to be changed when it's in their advantage, but not yeah. when it's in the people's advantage. The system, though, is, is well known and well established. It is a parliamentary democracy. But suddenly we have 100 MPs. Uh, yeah, the, we the, have, it's a parliamentary democracy, and the system is that whoever is, has the largest party, the leader of that party, is invited by the, the monarch to form a government. If they can, then they continue as Prime Minister. If they can't, then they don't. Yeah. And the reason that Liz Truss had to phone the Prime Minister, uh, the King to say, I can't go on, is she realised she didn't have the support of her MPs. That's also why Boris went, because 60 mm -hmm. members of his government, parliamentary private secretaries and ministers, were resigning. So yeah. he certainly... Nick is absolutely right. He is not the unity candidate. Well, 148 He's certainly voted against him. A, a charismatic character and interesting and fun and all that. Yeah. But it's actually... So I think what is going to happen is... Well, what, what probably should happen is some kind of a serious player comes in and leads a government of all the talents of the Conservative MPs who were elected only three years ago. Yeah. That is the way the system works. And I don't think you can really get around that unless you want to change the system overall, mm. which maybe in the fullness of time people do. The, the, pro the problem is, though, I think, is that the Conservative Party is so divided, it's quite hard to see them doing that. And I'm someone who, when this leadership contest got announced yesterday, I thought, they'll never do it. They'll never put Boris Johnson on a ballot to members. But actually, 18 hours later, I'm starting to think Conservative MPs are pretty desperate. They all think they're pretty certain to lose the next election. I think enough of them might think, oh, well, maybe let's take a gamble. We know there's this standards Better the devil committee. We know. Yeah, we know there's a standards committee investigation into him, but, I mean, can it really get any worse? He's the only person who might be able to pull something out of the bag. And I, I'm actually starting to feel a bit worried. They might do it. Nick, what do you think? Because the, the, the Tories have this history of, of, che of choosing a kind of compromised candidate that kind of muddles through. I'm thinking back in the days of John Major and so forth. Do you think they'll go with that? I guess in this guise is Rishi Sunak. Or do you think they'll gamble? and go with Boris? I think the reason that uh, whoever runs for, goes forward has to have 100 MPs supporting them. I think that's an attempt they want to keep Boris out because they mm. know if it gets to a playoff between Boris Johnson and A and other, the Tory members out there in the country will go for Boris Johnson. So I think Sir Graham Brady, and it is within his right and his colleagues in the 1922 committee, are doing whatever they can to try and to keep Boris back. But here's another interesting point, and this is maybe a broader conversation. We are continually told that the British system, the first past the post, gives a strong and stable government. And we laugh at countries like Belgium and Italy and elsewhere that have other voting systems. It's, it's not for now, but it's for another time. Maybe Giles would have a view, I don't know. Um, if, if this is so strong and stable, how come we've had so many prime ministers in such a short order? I know, Giles, you, you know, you've stood for election out of all of us. You've actually done it. It's clearly... We need to review whether the first past the post actually works, Giles, having, having done it yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I think... I, I mean, I, actually, I do think it does, broadly yeah. speaking, does work. Yeah, not... The real problem here, from the Conservative point of view, is 13 years. Mm. If you look at history since the war, basically no party survives longer than mm. 13 years. It becomes too frayed at the edges. There are too many MPs who, who become free, freewheeling because they've not, you know, they're disappointed, they're not going to be advantaged. It, it becomes frayed at the edges. Mm. So that, I think, is, is the real enemy. What I would want, I think what most people would want, is a grown-up of some kind in charge with the best people who are available to form the government. 
that grown-up could be Keir Starmer, is all I'm saying, Giles. Yes, we... it, it certainly could. <laughs> and when the election comes, it could well be. Mm. I mean, Keir Starmer, the person who felt that the right person only three years ago was Jeremy Corbyn. Everybody's views change as time goes by. You know I like to talk about money. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about this annual allowance of £115,000 that Liz Truss is now entitled to. Will she definitely get that? Because I know there's been calls for her not to get that. We ought to make it clear, it is an allowance for, as it were, business expenses. It's not a payment to her. She, she won't get £115,000. It's not £115,000 right, yeah. for her. But she could go and spend £115,000? If she is. It was introduced when Mrs Thatcher ceased to be Prime Minister. And Mrs Thatcher, being a global figure, it was felt she had to have an office to help her run things, she had to have secretaries and security and all of that. It was to fund that. And you have to actually show what you're going to spend it on. Mm. So it's you don't get public duties uh, cost. But, but it's, you it's don't get 115000 yeah, yeah. like that. But it, it's one thing when you served a country for, you know, 10 years, 12 years, and um, I absolutely agree then. The taxpayer does have a bit of a duty to fund your office. Um, you're still a public figure on the world stage. Liz Truss has been Prime Minister for 44 days and I think it is a bit of an anomaly it that was, she gets to access this it allowance. It was under it? Harold Wilson, when he was about to retire, that he came up with the idea of having a car for life. <laughs> so it was like Harold Wilson said, well, I think, I think we can... Or took his pipe out, we'll have a car for life. So they all want a little bit of something. Nick, uh, Nick I don't imagine this been... has gone down very well with the LBC listeners. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. They are livid. But let's point out, let's point out... You don't have to take it all. For instance, Theresa May, la the last year for which we have figures, she only claimed half. So it is an allowance. It is for your secretary or your transport or whatever it might be. I think it would be incredibly mean-spirited to say, oh, I absolutely take on board. She will probably have done just over 50 days by the time she departs. She it would be incredibly mean-spirited not to allow it, but I very much doubt she'll take it all. I think it will be appropriate, as the last Prime Minister but one has shown. Yeah. Just on that little joke there... Uh, there was an interesting tweet last night from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. Not, I would have thought, a natural conservative, from what he says. Simply mm, saying... No, I would, I would agree with you saying on that, Saying that, actually, just remember, there's a human being involved in here. Yeah, she might and be she's, security. And she's, well, no, not security. Actually, he was saying he, he was going to pray for her and her family. Think of her teenage children, think Aww. of her husband. Think of, actually, the, for her, if you are a politician, it's the ambition of your life to be Prime Minister. Mm. She was Foreign Secretary, she was a minister for several years. By all accounts, she was an excellent constituency MP. And this has been a terrible humiliation for mm. her. Yeah. And it's actually be doing that in public, it, it's, it's tough. I'm, I'm not excusing mm. it. I'm, mm. She's done the right thing resigning. All I'm saying is the Archbishop of Canterbury might be hubris, is just still reminding person, us right? yeah, there is a, a human being here. Uh, Nick, we have to, you, we, we have we to lose let you, go, Nick. Nick, don't we? Thank you Thank so you much. Have a lovely day, Nick. Good to see you. Thank you.